In 1831, a few days before Christmas, in the mountain community of Kona in Western North Carolina, 19-year-old Charles Silvers was brutally murdered in his cabin. He was struck across his neck with an ax and then dismembered. Parts of his body were burned in the fireplace, while others were hidden outside in a hole near a spring. So who killed Charles? Why was he killed? And the most important question we're all asking ourselves, did someone write a song about this? I mean, that is what I want to know when I hear about esoteric crimes in different parts of history. Like, can I can I sing about it though? Is there is there a song about this weird thing that happened? I will I will sing it. Hi, I'm Sarah Lynch Thomason. If you like folk songs, folklore, history, or true crime, then I recommend you go ahead and hit that subscribe button below. People have been writing songs and committing crimes and writing songs about committing crimes pretty much as long as there have been people. As a singer of traditional songs from Britain, Ireland, and the United States, I can tell you that folks have been singing songs about real life murders, heists, stolen identities, and more for hundreds and hundreds of years. These songs can tell us a lot about the past, but they can also lead us astray, telling us what we want to hear instead of what really happened. So let's put these songs to the test. With each episode of True Crime Ballads, we'll learn a song about a true crime and then review the facts of the case. We'll see if the song gets us any closer to the truth and what the less than true parts of the song can teach us as well. And if you want to learn to sing the song yourself, you can view my teaching video, tagged here and linked in the notes below. And if there's a true crime ballad you want me to cover, let me know in the comments. Last thing before we dive in. Today's episode is sponsored in part by a grant from the Country Dance and Song Society, or CDSS. CDSS supports people in building and sustaining vibrant communities through participatory dance, music, and song. You can find out more at cdss.org. Now, let's get spooky. Today we are investigating a true crime from my neck of the woods in North Carolina, the Frankie Silver murder case. On December 22, 1831, Charles Silver was murdered in his cabin, dismembered and partially cremated. No one noticed Charles's disappearance at first, but a few weeks later, in early January of 1832, a neighbor became suspicious and decided to take a look around Charles's cabin. And he found Charles, or parts of him. According to oral tradition, Charles's dog Drum, who never left his owner's side, was skulking about the cabin, staying close to what was left of his owner's body. Immediately, suspicion fell on Charles's young wife, Frankie Stewart Silver. Frankie had married Charles when they were both in their teens. They had settled into their cabin in 1830 and had a child, a little girl named Nancy. Frankie was arrested, along with her mother and brother, but eventually those two were let go and Frankie alone was charged with murder. Frankie's trial began in March of 1832. All of the evidence against her would be considered circumstantial today. No one had witnessed the murder and there was no direct proof that she had done it. Frankie was never allowed to testify. At the time, North Carolina law considered the accused to be an incompetent witness. And this wasn't just a North Carolina thing. This was the law across many parts of the United States, and it only started to change in the mid to late 19th century. So Frankie was never allowed to take the stand in her own defense. Some of the testimony given described Charles as behaving brutally towards Frankie. But during this period, it was common and perfectly legal for men to moderately chastise their wives. So this might not have created much sympathy for Frankie. The all-male jury was initially divided, but eventually found Frankie guilty, and the judge sentenced her to be hanged. Frankie appealed the verdict. The North Carolina Supreme Court heard her appeal in May of 1832, but in June they denied it. As word of Frankie's case spread, North Carolina citizens were appalled at the idea of the state executing a young mother. Hundreds of pleas to spare Frankie's life poured into the governor's office. Seven of the 12 jurors from Frankie's trial even wrote to the governor, saying that they knew she was guilty, but that she shouldn't be hanged. The governor never responded to these petitions. Meanwhile, Frankie herself took action to prevent her execution. With the help of family and friends, she broke out of prison, cut her hair, dressed up as a man, and started traveling south with her father and uncle. Eventually, though, a sheriff caught up with the family, recognized Frankie, and sent her back to prison. In early July of 1833, with her execution imminent, Frankie confessed to her friends and her lawyer that she had, in fact, killed Charles. 
There are no known existing copies of this confession, but according to one newspaper, the confession stated that Charles was loading a gun and threatening to kill Frankie when she struck him in self-defense. Many people who read the confession felt that Frankie should have been charged with manslaughter, not murder. On July 12, 1833, Frankie was taken to be hanged in Morganton, North Carolina. A wooden wall was constructed around the area of her execution, but some sightseers still managed to get a view. Her father took charge of her body, but he couldn't get it all the way back home to Kona. Her corpse was going to rot in the summer heat, so he had her buried about eight miles west of Morganton. By the way, we don't know where Frankie was buried, but this gravestone was later placed at a probable location. Meanwhile, Charles's body was discovered in pieces over time. He's buried at the cemetery of the Kona Baptist Church, and the popular lore is that he's buried in three different places, with headstones all next to each other. I got to visit that cemetery recently, and sure enough, there are three different footstones that all have the initials CS on them for Charles Silver. In the mid-1880s, a poem called Francis Silver's Confession was published in a North Carolina newspaper. Written decades before by a man named Thomas Scott, the poem is written from the perspective of Frankie on the day of her execution. As you'll hear, she imagines being down in hell, being confronted by the ghost of Charles, and recounts committing his murder. Let's take a listen. As we go, we'll keep track of what's true and false. Fire means that the lyrics are hiding something from us, just like the fire that burned away parts of Charles's body. A dog means that the lyrics are true, just like Charles's dog Drum, who helped to locate the body. This is a shortened version of the ballad, and you can find a link to the full lyrics in the notes below. This dreadful, dark, and dismal day has swept my glories all away. The sun goes down, my days are past, and I must leave this world at last. I know that frightful ghosts I'll see, gnawing their flesh in misery, and then and there condemned be for murder in the first degree. It's there I'll see that mournful face Whose blood I spilled upon this place With flaming eyes to me he'll say Why did you take my life away? The jealous thought that first gave strife To make me take my husband's life for months and days I spent my time thinking on how to commit this crime. And on a dark and doleful night, I put his body out of sight. With flames I tried to consume, but time would not admit it done. You all see me and on me gaze. Be careful how you spend your days. And don't commit this awful crime, but try to serve your God in time. My mind on solemn subjects rolls. My little child, God bless her soul. All you who are of let not my sins this child disgrace. Great God, how shall I be forgiven? Not fit for earth, not fit for heaven. But little time to pray to God, for now I try that awful road. Welcome back. Let's review. The jealous thought that first gave strife to make me take my husband's life. For months and days, I spent my time thinking on how to commit this crime. Oh boy, okay, this one gets two fires. This verse would have us believe that Frankie murdered Charles out of jealousy and that the murder was premeditated. The prosecution did actually make this argument at Frankie's trial, 
but from everything we know, she probably acted in self-defense and did not plan the murder ahead of time. Honestly, if she had, she probably wouldn't have left such a mess. I mean, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay, next. And on a dark and doleful night, I put his body out of sight. With flames I tried to consume, but time would not admit it done. Yes, this gets our dog drum. Frankie did try to burn Charles's body, possibly with the help of her mother and brother. Neighbors even reported a smell. And saying she tried to burn the body is accurate. It was definitely an incomplete job. By the way, if you want to learn how hard it is to naturally cremate a corpse, I want you to watch my death awareness hero Caitlin Doty's video on the botched cremation of Graham Parsons, tagged here. Next. My mind on solemn subjects rolls. My little child, God bless her soul. All you who are of Adam's race, let not my sins this child disgrace. This verse gets a drum. Frankie was likely worried about the fate of her young daughter, Nancy, from whom she'd been separated since her arrest. After Frankie's execution, Nancy was legally given over to the care of her grandmother, Frankie's mother. She grew up, she was married twice, and according to some sources, she named her first son, Charles, after her father. She died in 1901, and unfortunately, that's about all we know about her. Last, you all see me and on me gaze, be careful how you spend your days, and don't commit this awful crime, but try to serve your God in time. This verse gets fire, because it gives us the false impression that throughout this entire song, Frankie has been addressing an audience, perhaps from the scaffold. It's been a popular belief for a long time that Frankie sang this ballad right before her execution, but it's not true. Since the 17th century, it's been a popular tradition for ballad authors to write songs from the perspective of convicted persons who are about to be executed. It's standard in these songs for the convicted to confess their crimes and to grieve over their impending death. But in this case, at least, it's all false. We know that Frankie spoke very little at her execution. In fact, oral tradition states that she did open her mouth to speak at one point, and her father cried out, die with it in you, Frankie, and she fell silent. So how did this ballad do? Overall, it obscures more than it reveals. The idea that Frankie was a jealous wife who planned the murder and then confessed everything to a crowd of onlookers gives us a really false impression of this case. And frankly, it's really insulting to Frankie. At the same time, I really like this song. It's beautifully written, and I find Frankie's fear of death very relatable. So if you want to share this song, I just recommend giving some context beforehand. As always, songs can tell us about the past, but the past is always more complicated than a song. Finally, yes, it's still relevant. In the United States, lots of women are imprisoned because they defended themselves against their abusers. According to the ACLU, nearly 60% of people in women's prisons nationwide have a history of being physically or sexually abused before being incarcerated. A study in California found that 93% of women in prison for killing their significant others had been abused by them. In that same study, 67% of those women reported that they had killed their partner while attempting to protect themselves or their children. And it's even worse for African-American women. Another study has shown that black women are twice as likely as white women to be punished for killing their abusive husbands. You can learn more and connect with organizations working on these issues in the notes below. That's it for the first episode of True Crime Ballads. What would you like to see me cover next? Remember, it doesn't have to be about murder. It could be sinking a ship, stealing a throne, or being an imposter. Let me know in the notes below. And until next time, be well and sing on.